Um, I'm, I now get to introduce a special guest that we have with us who is our uh, chair of the Department of English here at the University of Colorado, and he has been a great supporter of this event, has um, shared our enthusiasm for it. Um, so I, I'll introduce William Cuskin to give a few remarks. He, um, he's a medievalist. He is a, an amazing authority on Caxton. And his, uh, the book that he's working on now is called Recursive Origins. And it focuses on the relationship between the medieval and early modern periods. So William will give us a hand. Thank you all for coming. I, am, I look upon this, this gathering and I'm amazed. It is a wonderful group. I can't think of the time that we had this many people here for an English department conference. It's, <laughs> it is wonderful. So I, th I welcome you all to our campus and I thank you for coming. The conference is landmarks. And it's landmarks to celebrate the 20th anniversary. But it's also landmarks in other senses. One real sense is, this is a landmark conference for English. It's wonderful to me to see the strength, the force of intellectual interest here. It's also, I have to say, a landmark of human effort. A landmark of human effort. The logistics involved in getting this size of conference together, the, the effort in getting the money raised for this endeavor is simply staggering. I've watched Jill, Kelly, and I, don't, I can't see Kirsten now. She ran off. I've watched them over the years work together to make this happen. And it is amazing. It is astounding. And, and what's astounding is that it just lies on top of everything else they have to do. Well, that's a perfect segue because I get to introduce Jill, who's going to be moderating uh, our panel tonight. So not only does Professor Hyde Stevenson deserve an immense amount of credit for just thinking about every single little detail, and um, I mean, Kirsten and I would have been totally lost, but Jill knows everything that needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we're so grateful to her for that and for all of her um, direction. But she's also an incredible scholar. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, I'm sure you already know some. Um, Professor Hyde Stevenson has published on narrative history, or excuse me, narrative theory, fashion, cosmopolitanism, ruins, and landscape architecture, and has focused on such authors as Jane Austen, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Mariah Edgeworth, Frances Burney, and Bernardin de St. Pierre. Um, her books include Austen's Unbecoming Conjunctions, Subversive Laughter, Embodied History. Um, she has also published uh, with Charlotte Sussman uh, a book called Recognizing the Romantic Novel, New Histories of British Fiction, 18, 1780 to 1830. And her current book project is entitled The Afterlife of Things, Belongings in 19th Century French and British Literature. So I'll turn the time to Jill. Thank you very much, and again, thank you for coming. And I just want to say briefly that I admire and respect Kelly and Kirsten so much, and they have just done an astonishing job. So uh, it's my privilege uh, to begin here by introducing Julie Carlson, who's professor of English at UC Santa Barbara. She is the edit editor of a collection, Domestic Tragedy, and is the author just since 2000 of 13 articles on subjects as diverse as Joanna Bailey, Fancy's History, Germaine de Stahl, Coleridge, Hazlitt, and Inchbald. Primarily, however, we admire and revere Jewelry for her monographs. Uh, England's first family of writers, William Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft, and Mary Shelley, is just out recently from Johns Hopkins. It is an illuminating book. In it, Professor Carlson transforms our understanding of British Romanticism, showing how it was indeed a theatrical age. She demonstrates how Wordsworth, Keats, Byron, Shelley, and especially Coleridge all wrote plays which were central to England's poetic and political reform. And she argues that romantic discourse on theater is crucial to the constructions of gender and of nation in the period. Her substantial and authoritative study opens up an entire body of neglected work, powerfully showing how these plays, often merely considered just 
Closet dramas or mental theater instead participate vibrantly in the debates of the French Revolution. In her second, I'm sorry, I got the uh, title wrong of that, that particular thing. I think I was editing, cutting and editing in a moment of panic. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, the, the, the real book of England's first family of writers, Mary Wollstonecraft, William Godwin, Mary Shelley, <laughs> demonstrates how and why these individuals can best be understood within the framework of the family unit in which they were created. Uh, in this highly original and groundbreaking work, we find another first here for Julie, uh, is the first scholar to consider the Godwin Shelley collectively showing us how this family produced works that intimately conversed with each other. But this is also a book about books and the ways that they live and the way they breathe and the way they inform life and death. It's called a riveting and major work. It's called a study that offers a rare mix of creativity and philosophical rigor. It represents scholarship that will continue making for many years to come a signal contribution to our understanding of the Godwins and Shelleys. Now coming out soon is a co-edited book called Speaking About Torture. And she's currently writing a book on books and friends in post-7090 culture that considers the famous fallings out between friends as a way to explore how books befriend the mind. In addition to her impressive scholarly contributions, we also find in Julie an extraordinary person and one I'm proud to call a friend, one who's offered much to all of the communities in which she lives. For example, she's the co-director of Project Excel, an academic preparation initiative for local African American and American Indian students in grades five to 12. And she has been for years a vigorous supporter of other scholars, as well as an inspiration to graduate students and colleagues working in her field. So please join me in welcoming Julie Carlson. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Wow. So I do want to thank especially the three graces and all of the rest <laughs> of you for being here and um, all of the work that's gone into this conference, which has been really amazing. Um, the one thing I can probably, well, the one thing I'll promise about this ta uh, talk is that the topic will be the experience, which is <laughs> fortitude and frailty. <laughs> <laughs> My focus on Fanny Holcroft's Fortitude and Frailty refers at once to her four-volume novel, Fortitude and Frailty, published in 1817 and reviewed in La Belle Assemblée of 1 December 1817 as worthy the pen of the offspring of Thomas Holcroft, and to how her fortitude addresses the frailty of mortal life and the gender distinctions that result from human subjection to the passions. In this, her novel and thinking follow on contemporary definitions that disarticulate fortitude from courage in line with the general move to interiorize formerly external di displays of power. As George Crabbe's English Synonyms Explained of 1818 explains, quote, courage respects actions, fortitude respects passion. Courage is that power of the mind which bears up against the evil that is in prospect. Uh, fortitude is that power which endures the pain that is felt. Courage seems to be more of a manly virtue. Fortitude is more distinguishable as a feminine virtue. A claim and a virtue that Wollstonecraft's The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which references fort fortitude nine times, seeks to substantiate. Besides drawing attention to a very understudied Romantic era woman writer and example of family authorship, my focus on Fanny Holcroft's fortitude engages two broader questions that have animated my work for some time. The function of books and friends and the function of books as friends in providing modes of detachment from the press of blood ties and blood relations, where, de where detachment is less objectivity than gaining some breathing space within one's attachments. And second, how this linkage perpet perpetuates new philosophical efforts to ensure that one's attachments expand rather than contract one's heart and mind, even after the new philosophy has been discredited by the alleged failure of the French Revolution. 
inscribed, I, I put my hand up when it's a quote just because it takes too long to keep saying quote, so. Inscribed to the revered memory of her lamented father, its title page announces, set for the first two volumes in fashionable, ba in fashionable Bath in London, but then moving in volumes three and four to Paris in the early days of the French Revolution, and from there to Germany, and characterizing its worthy male protagonist, Archibald Campbell, as a philosopher who approaches love as a subject to reason and a subject for it, Holcroft's fortitude and frailty is centrally engaged in reassessing the dreams of revolution from a post-1790s and an avowedly post-bliss cultural perspective. Still, Holcroft's narrator goes out of his or her way to make clear that that reality is clear. Though the hopes which it kindled have met with frequent and bitter disappointments, none but the confirmed misanthrope will be willfully blind to the good which has been achieved or the ponderous mass of evil which has been removed. Whether the government be rep republican or monarchical, if the people have a free voice and are unima sorry, unanimous in progressive reform, no true lover of his country can lament that revolution which we will hope has laid the basis of rational freedom. The thematic link that connects the courtship and marriage plot, which is oriented around a triangle of our benevolent philosopher, Archibald Campbell, the beautiful, kind-hearted, and intelligent Eleanor Fairfax, and the cunning barrister and cad, Leoline Hargrave, what links that plot to revolutionary activity in Paris and court intrigues in both France and Saxony is the psychological focus on enthusiasm which it is the work of the novel to replace with fortitude in order to safeguard personal and political futures. As many have noted, enthusiasm is a psychological swing or pivot term in the period in which the susceptibility that enthusiasm connotes as a positive trait in either gender can result in delusion and fanaticism, which assume the particular gendered outcomes not always, but of um, erotic idolatry in women and mob violence, whether political or religious, in men. Our heroine, Eleanor, whose attractive traits are regarded by all parties, is equally regarded by all of them as having one flaw, a romantic enthusiasm that leads her to paint others, like the grand Michelangelo, or more properly, like the divine Raphael, in accordance with beautiful ideals themselves pictured in the simplicity, purity, and benevolence of her own heart. In love with Eleanor, though acting, he believes, out of disinterested concern for her happiness, Worthy Campbell avails himself of every opportunity of reminding her that her best friends thought her enthusiasm not only too great, but dangerous, a resolution that plays into the unprincipled hands of Leoline, who feigns affection for Eleanor, in order to acquire her fortune and her family connections. Eleanor falls for him and his scheme primarily because Campbell's, Archibald Campbell, I sometimes go back and forth on that, uh, Campbell's admonitions arising out of his wish to see her perfect counteracted all that afterward became the most ardent wishes of his soul. This plot configuration allows the narrative to establish two points about how the frailty to which enthusiasm leaves one vulnerable is mitigated by fortitude. For while Archibald's schooling of Eleanor's enthusiasm cools her rising affections and diverts them to Leoline, uh, Archibald is linked to Eleanor as himself an enthusiast in the defense of certain systems and principles and even in the praise he bestowed on his favorite friends. It's a funky text. Uh, their shared zeal for philanthropy and open-hearted approach to others leave both of them, as well as the novel's more seasoned adults, like her aunt and uncle, leaves them vulnerable to the manipulations of persons like Leoline and his sister, who depend and prey on the unsuspecting nature of those who approach the shield of human nature from the golden side. How could an artless, inexperienced girl imagine that such looks may be assumed alike by the impassioned and sincere lover or the male coquette who makes, a lo who makes love a studied science. This studied quality of the libertine applies equally to the demagogue, whose rhetorical power inheres in infiltrating minds that are less on their guard. 
But in drawing the connection, the narrator carefully distinguishes Archibald's enthusiasm from Eleanor's on this score. He never ventured to call even the warmest professors by the sacred name of friends till their actions had confirmed their words. Or in Archibald's words, instead of blaming the enthusiasm of friendship, I am persuaded it is a virtue that is always found to be the strongest in the purest hearts. But friendship is not a hot hothouse plan. Like the fo forest oak, it is solid but slow of growth. Still a quote. The, f the facility which induces us to believe that all who make great professions mean everything they profess springs from an excess of virtue, but it is as pernicious in its effects as though it were the very reverse. This emphasis on friendship and reliance on its enthusiasm to the extent friendship is tested by time, or that is, enthusiasm is tested by time and the conformity of words to deeds, is how the novel mitigates the rashness that threatens male visionaries and female dreamers. Cool deliberation will accomplish that which rash, rash impetuosity cannot achieve, and mental fortitude is a more beneficial quality than personal courage. This applies to love as well as social revolution, where the novel not only models good marriages on friendship, but also suggests that, owing to their propensity for romantic enthusiasm, impressionable women like Eleanor should, should consult the judgment of your more experienced friends before forming any intimacy with strangers. Failing that, they must act with fortitude and candor should they discover, upon better acquaintanceship, that their imaginations have deceived them. In voicing, and I know these are well-known tropes in, in certain respects, in voicing such public and private hopes for friend, fortitude and frailty endorses new philosophical approaches to perfectibility more than a decade after the Jacobin novel has been declared dead, which it's usually, right, it's always terminated in 1805, replacing reason with friend in ways that make reliance on friend not only more humane, but also intersubjective. Equally interesting to me is its pursuit of a personal agenda in voicing a defense of father, wa uh, father writer friend Thomas Holcroft, whose life writings manifest his friendship to mankind through plays and novels that warn the unsuspecting about fashionable society, travel narratives and translations that bridge European and Anglo-Indian cultures and peoples, memoirs often to inspire the emulation of youth, especially working class boys, and his status, that's his most famous uh, trait, as acquitted felon in the treason trials of 1794, an honor and a stigma that he never shakes off. Holcroft highlights the personal public agenda by prefacing the novel with lines to the memory of the late Thomas Holcroft that beseech her pen to impart the glowing praise due to the best of parents, best of men, whose mighty mind combined genius and wit with fortitude and caused him to live the friend revered, the guide of youth. This last line announces a private, private settling of scores over Holcroft's friendship with Godwin. Relevant to this argument are two factors that ultimately bring me to the conference's focus on landmarks. One is the long-delayed publication in 1816 of memoirs of the late Thomas Holcroft, begun by Holcroft on his deathbed just two months before he dies, he dies on March 23, 1809, and finished by William Hazlitt from his diary correspondence and interviews with friends, whose short preface by Hazlitt is wholly devoted to detailing Holcroft's fortitude in dictating his memoirs when speaking caused him excruciating pain. The second fact, or set of events really, is Holcroft's falling out with best friend Godwin over the minor character Mr. Scarborough in Godwin's Fleetwood or the New Man of Feeling in late February 1805, and to whom Holcroft never speaks again. Until he, for, uh, until he requests to see Godwin four days before he dies, a reunion that the memoirs memori uh, immortalizes with the bare bones affirmation, my dear, dear friend. I've written a lot about this elsewhere, but I can talk about it later if this is unfamiliar ground, which it probably is. Raising the status of memorializing in the framework of new, new philosophical beliefs in writing 
as what keeps the dream alive, brings together two of the correlates given in the OED under landmark. From ancient times, Sippus, or a pillar with an inscription, a gravestone, employed as a landmark, a memorial of remarkable events, especially as a sepulchral monument, and the newly emergent concept of time mark, defined as a significant point in time, a landmark in time, used first, or so the OED says, in the Gentleman's Magazine in 1828. Even more germane to my interest is the OED's second listed example that cites a letter of Coleridge's that states as the duty of all men to put their testimony on record, which, though it may not avail in the present times, will yet serve as a time mark for the future. I want to suggest then that Fortitude and Frailty and Hazlitt's contributions to the memoirs of the late Thomas Holcroft represent tandem testimonials of this friend of mankind that seek to keep open the future invested in that dream. They each differently defend Holcroft against general detra detractors of the new philosophy and against charges that are at the core of the break with Godwin. The general charge relates to the subversive nature of these principles, epitomized in Holcroft's being branded as an acquitted felon, as a result of which he became a mark for venal pens and slanderous tongues, this is from the memoir, was driven from his country as a prescribed man and found it increasingly difficult to gain an unbiased reception for his later writings. The specific charge associated with the break with Godwin concerns the severity of his and new philosophical strictures in general, especially as they undermine or are said to undermine the educability because the susceptibility of youth. The break, just briefly, occurs because Holcroft views the minor character, uh, Mr. Scarborough, as modeled on himself. And Scarborough is a character who holds himself in the narrative responsible for the death of his son, owing to his parental severity. And of course, Holcroft's son William commits suicide and so at age 16, and so you can imagine this is a scene that would resonate. Uh, far uh, okay, so that's the, that's the specific charge, the severity issue. Far from subversive, Hazlitt writes, the whole of the modern philosophy, this is the first charge, is nothing more than a literal, rigid, unaccommodating, and systematic interpretation of the text, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, without making any allowances, sorry, for the weaknesses of mankind or the degree to which this rule was practicable. This is Hazlitt again. However wild and visionary this scheme may appear, its greatest fault is in expecting higher things of human nature than it seems at present capable of, and in exacting such a divine or angelic degree of virtue and wisdom before it can be put into practice. As regards parental severity, Hazlitt introduces his account of the severest blow that fortune had yet inflicted on him, the death of his son, by stating that this unhappy event has been sometimes misrepresented by persons unacquainted with the character and feelings, or too well, uh, uh, by the, with the character and feelings of Mr. Holcroft. And then he proceeds to narrate how William had been brought up, if anything, with too much care and tenderness, and that less than an hour before he ran away, and then the board ship when he shoots himself, uh, his father conversed with him in the most affectionate manner praised, encouraged, and told him that notwithstanding his former errors and wanderings, he was convinced he would become a good and excellent man. Now, Fanny Holcroft's approach in the novel is less direct, since it's a novel, but certain episodes in this admittedly highly digressive novel seem overdetermined, at least to me, by the determination to address similar charges and the fortitude that developed out of his continual confrontation with these charges. A first set of charges addresses again the alleged criminality and government persecution of dangerous innovators like Campbell, who is indicted and imprisoned in Paris as a traitor, owing to his efforts to befriend a French noble attempting to secure what is left of his estate for his wife and child awaiting him in England, and to whom Campbell gives his passport in order to facilitate his escape. Moreover, the episode conflates two separate instances of government harassment of Holcroft 
by adding to the charge of traitor that he is also a spy. The accusation that was circulated in the Times in February 1802, which causes Fanny to be dismissed from her newly acquired position in the Montcachel household in Paris, where she was serving as instructor to the daughters of Lady Montcachel. Campbell, the character now, uh, Campbell's midnight reflections in his dungeon borrow a page from Holcroft's undelivered self-defense from the treason trial, which he then publishes the next year as a narrative of facts relating to a prosecution for high treason. To wit, this is from the novel, but echoing the, tra the treatise, an approving conscience will teach me to meet my fate with the fortitude of a man. Man is supported under every calamity by that dignified fortitude which robs even vengeance and calumny of their malignant triumph, and nor did the cruelty and injustice he experienced excite feelings of revenge. A second set concerns the novel's scattered observations, they're all throughout, but in a random sort of way, scattered observations on the reform of the stage and literary culture generally as a service to humanity, and in the case of Campbell's friend, Alexandre Lemaire, a, a preferred avenue for social revolution. We are told that, Disgusted with the scenes of tumult, faction, and intemperate heat that more or less disgraced each party in 1792, now he's, now he's talking about 1793 in Paris, Le Maire retires from military service and devotes his leisure hours to cultivation of literature and those studies which would enable him to forward the progress of knowledge and humanity. The most intriguing set, however, involves efforts to detach men of a grave philosophical turn from ascriptions of severity or a near repulsive degree of rigor. The narrator emphasizes that while his fortitude, it is true, was great, Archibald Campbell was a person of strong feelings and exquisite sensibility who frequently exerted all the eloquence of feeling and philosophy in order to calm the mental and dangerous agitation of his friend. That friend who ends up marrying our heroine Eleanor, not our man uh, of fortitude, clears up any lingering questions about paternal severity. His father dies and he reflects, uh, greatly as he reverenced the author, the loved author of his being, he does not form a just estimate of the filial obligations he contracts until the cruel stroke of death has broken the most sacred of ties and awakened him to a bitter but unavailing sense of the inadequate return he made to those anxieties that have daily wrung the paternal heart and that tenderness which none but a parent can feel. Designated as the primary trait of the philosophical mind that the novel at once analyzes and memorializes, Fanny Holcroft's fortitude, though, is not only a defense of Thomas Holcroft's principled friendships across the board, but an effort to negotiate the declared asymmetry in the friendship between Godwin and Holcroft as recounted in Holcroft's diary entry, this is early, of uh, 13 January 1799, that's now, being pu that's now published in the memoirs. He, uh, Holcroft, this is his diary, uh, has this dialogue between him and Godwin. This is Godwin. Godwin, there is another difference between us. I am so cowed and cast down by rude and unqualified assault, by which he means harsh critique of his writing, that for a time I am unable to recover. You, on the contrary, I consider as a man of iron." Now, amazingly enough to me, anyway, Holcroft, Thomas Holcroft, for quite some time accepts this characterization, and I can talk about that later, agreeing that he has been hardened in sufferance by the difficulties I have had to overcome. But he warns Godwin that this capacity to overcome feeling does not mean that his feelings are not as quick and as vigorous as ever. It's a warning. Fortitude and frailty does not take the root of Memoirs of Brian Perdue, which is the last of the Jacobin novels, Thomas Holcroft's. Uh, in, in, in the Memoirs presents a humane protagonist who's shown to be hardened by the sufferings that he has endured as a miseducated child, a convicted felon, and a writer who cannot gain a fair reception of his efforts to portray establishment figures as pestilential rogues. That's Purdue. But the oddities of its narrative voice in frailty, Fortitude and Frailty place it on similar ground, at the same time that its portrayals of the many and wholly success successful friendships of Archibald Campbell mean to show that his fortitude 
keeps his feelings quick and vigorous. But what does Fanny Holcroft make of fortitude as a bequest to women or to herself, especially given her major supporting role in her father's literary projects and Holcroft's inscription of his final play called The Vindictive Man of 1806 to my daughter Fanny, because you have dedicated your talents by your literary efforts to the cause of morality and thus have need of that patient resignation to which every writer is doomed. I want to conclude by suggesting just a couple of tantalizing avenues that I hope will encourage more scholars to consider Fanny Holcroft among the growing pantheon of Romantic era literary daughters. One from the novel, what should we make of Eleanor Fairfax's resistance to the advice of her well-meaning friends particularly, sorry, particularly as it relates to the forming of her attachments, and in particular to Mr. Fairfax, her surrogate father, uncle, his injunction to act with fortitude and candor should you, on a more intimate acquaintance with Mr. Hargrave, Leoline, find that your imagination has deceived you, which of course it has, I mean, he's a total cat. For even after a near mortal fever has convinced her of the danger of indulging in romantic enthusiasm and Eleanor determines to trust implicitly to the judgment of her best friends, she makes an exception on one point. For, in despite of reason, it cherished, and that it is weird, but I think it's her mind, it cherished a dread of him, it had been, sorry, it cherished a dread of him it had been once disposed to love. A dread that persists until each character happily marries another person. On one level, the target of each of their redirected affections, Archibald's wife is German, Eleanor's husband is French, furthers the expansion of heart at the core of new philosophical toleration. But Eleanor's willfulness, especially given that her whole behavior was circumspect, is largely unexplained, as is the novel's disinterest in depicting positive female friendships. It's a ton of male friendships, but not positive female. The topic of female friendship raises a second set of questions relating to literary biographical connections between Fanny Holcroft and Mary Shelley. Several episodes in Fortitude and Frailty, especially involving the odd man out, Archibald's eccentric uncle, Dugald MacDonald, who plans to emigrate to the wilds of America and perceives in Eleanor a true child of nature. They resonate, at least to me, with Lodora, the novel in which Shelley redefines fidelity to make it more accommodating to daughters struggling to transfer attachment from father to husband. Shelley's journal entry of 28 May 1817 notes that she is reading F. Holcroft's novel, and three days earlier she's reading Anna St. Ives. In terms of inherited family friendships, Shelley seems to refight her father's fight with Holcroft over Scarborough by describing Holcroft as a man of stern and irascible character, this is Mary Shelley, in whom rectitude and courage were the gods of his idolatry, but whose defect of temper rendered him a susceptible friend. And in, an, and in a stunning biographical reflection, she actually suggests that Holcroft's severity is in fact responsible for William's suicide. She says, the youth, William, was of an unfortunate disposition and his conduct was very reprehensible. At the same time, it is certain that Holcroft carried further than Godwin, uh, sorry, a certain unmitigated severity, an exposition of duty and truth and of the defalcation from these in the offender conceived in language to humiliate and wound, a want of sympathy with the buoyant spirit of youth when conjoined to heedlessness, and it may be added, dissipation, all of which tended to set wider the distance too usually observed between father and child. A final connecting thread, I feel, resides in the highly unusual name, Leoline. Circulating in manuscript for years, but making its appearance in print months before the pub just months before the publication of Fortitude and Frailty, Leoline has to conjure up Christabel for at least some readers and friends, and with it the function of daughters as a meeting and re-entry point for boyhood friends, especially for those who parted ne'er to meet again, but neither of whom ever found another to free the hollow heart from painting. Perhaps to a daughter of this man, 
also who married as his fourth wife, his close friend, Lucia, uh, Lucien Mercier's daughter, Louisa. The fortitude that the situation exacts is too exacting. Thank you. Thank you.